What's up, YouTube? Homegrown Big coming at you again. Yes, I'm putting out more videos. It's kind of exciting for me to, I've taken this week off for the first time for myself, taking a week off of school, work, family obligations, and I'm just at home <laughs> for like the first time in over two years. And so I thought I would take this time to uh, put out some more videos that I've had ideas on and uh, to just catch up on watching some videos from other YouTubers that I like. And it's been interesting. I might talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, so a lot of people have been asking more about food, and I will keep working on that. Here I am this morning. Uh, I've just done kettlebells and exercises, mm, some yoga. And I, uh, when I'm at home... And I have a day at home. I, I normally work out twice a day, but I normally do two shorter workouts. Uh, so that's why everything's still out. I'll do some some swings and squats uh, later on this afternoon. And my my breakfast here is a bowl of citrus. Let's see if you can see that. There's three types of citrus in there: uh, mandarins, grapefruit, and navel oranges. And uh, I've got some water. Yep. Uh, it's probably the most important thing I learned from my tenure in 80-10-10 is that fruit is, in fact, high-performance food, and fruit is, in fact, great for athletes, and fruit is, in fact, a meal and not just a snack. And fruit is, in fact, something that should be, in my opinion, as long as you don't have a strange genetic anomaly, there's some people who cannot actually digest fructose, uh, but if you are not of that ilk that fruit should be a regular part of your diet, everyday diet. So that said, um, this video, and I'm going to put the time down below where you can just skip ahead, uh, but I'm going to do a little bit of talking before I get into the, the pith of this video. I've had a lot of people um, challenging my credentials. And who am I to question doctors? And who am I to question registered dietitians? And I want to talk about this really specifically before I get into my challenging video. <laughs> I have never uh, proclaimed to be a doctor. I have never proclaimed to be a dietitian. I have never even proclaimed to be somebody who should be doling out advice. In fact, I've said just the opposite. If you watch my videos and you're not just coming here to make reactionary responses. And, uh, you know, that's where I've always come from. But what is my educational background? Well, I would like to share it with you in case you're wondering and you're new to this channel. I am a recent graduate of the University of Washington from their biology honors department. UW is a top 20 school in the globe in biology. It is highly competitive. It is difficult to get into their biology program. I transferred to the University of Washington with a GPA of 367. Being in the biology honors program meant that I had to do extra work on top of their already rigorous program. Every quarter, I had to do extra work on top of their already rigorous program. It also meant that I had to do research. I spent three years plus, three years at UW, but before then I did research as well, doing rigorous scientific method research which is why I'm now, right now, preparing to write my first manuscript with myself as the first author. I am also a member of Tri Beta Beta, which is the National Biological Honor Society for Research Biology. In addition to that, I am a Mary Gates Research Scholar and an on-site National Science Scholar. I have worked very hard and put in thousands of hours to garner the knowledge that I dare speak about. <laughs> 
in these videos. That's why you will see six month gaps in my presence on social media. Because while people are busy screwing around arguing, I'm putting in hundreds and thousands of hours to science mastery. But I will say that no, I'm not a doctor. Nope, I'm not. I have different experience. I have less experience. I have no clinical experience. I'm not a PhD. Not even close. I've already said these things. I'm not pretending to be anybody or anything. But I will tell you this, every single one of us should be willing and should challenge any person who's speaking as an authoritarian or a absolutist doctor or scientist. Because true science and true medicine knows there are not absolutes. So I will challenge any person, a YouTuber, a blogger, a doctor, a PhD, I will challenge any person to their claims that are absolute. You better believe it. And I think every other person should too. Any person who's making claims about anything, whether it's medicine, science, math, or whatever, has to be challenged. That is the nature of being an academic or a scientist or a doctor. You have to be willing to support and refute and argue and debate your claims. That is how we do it. That is the scientific method. So, you want to challenge me? I absolutely encourage you to challenge me. But don't say that I'm not educated and that I don't know what I'm talking about. I am educated and I have put in hundreds and thousands of hours to get to where I'm at. And I would ask that you show a little bit of deference and respect for that. Sure, challenge me. And I may be wrong. I've been wrong lots of times and I am willing to say when I'm wrong. And I like being wrong because as soon as I'm wrong or as soon as I'm able to revise or edit my understanding on any topic, I've learned something. And any person who's not willing to revise, edit, or change their perspectives, you got to watch out for those people. And I think it shows a lack of intelligence to be that kind of a person. And I think it shows a belief system over a way of thinking and a way of presenting current knowledge. All right, I had to have a little nourishment break, but let's get started. Before I go any further, I want to say that all of the sources and literature that I use for this video are in the information section. I put a, I put a whole citation page down there, so feel free to check my sources, read the papers yourself, get involved with uh, reading science, and uh, and see what you think yourself. Um, I think that it's important that every single person reads scientific literature and endeavors to understand the research methods. And I think that's one of the fallbacks with like some YouTubers who haven't been educated in biology or research methods who just like to throw up research papers to defend their arguments without maybe perhaps understanding if the research was done properly or if the statistics were done properly and I'm not sure that they're able to fully challenge it but I still think nonetheless the more you read and research and if you don't understand something you start looking things up the broader your base of understanding is going to be and, and that's only going to help us all so the next thing that I want to say and I put a link in the information section to this this blog and a link to this guy's YouTube page on my page. And I really want to bring to attention uh, Dr. Stephen Guayane. And some of the paleo enthusiasts will definitely know him because he has spoken at ancestral health symposiums. Um, but I think most people haven't really heard of him and he is without doubt probably one of my top three health science 
uh, bloggers. And uh, he is a, a PhD, a doctor of neurobiology obesity, and he researches how the brain turns on and turns off obesity. He is uh, really into doing uh, nutrition science research and blogging, and he is one of the most intelligent, fairest um, voices out on the internet, in my opinion. He's very good at taking complex science and distilling it down into really digestible and readable blogs. And he doesn't have a lot on his YouTube page, I think, because he's a busy person <laughs> and he has a job and these sort of things. Um, but his blog, however, is fairly active. Uh, the other reason that I really love him is that he is huge into growing his own food and providing his own food. And he is an advocate of that and he understands how important that is for our environment and for our personal health. And then the third reason why I really like him is because he is a person who has experimented with veganism and vegetarianism and he knows about that and he has some really great um, blogs on his professional opinion as a doctor of neurobiology obesity on whether or not being an omnivore or vegetarian or vegan is healthiest. And, you know, somebody had said, well, hey, if you're so sure about your stance against, uh, you know, veganism being healthy, and I never said that. I said, I don't believe that veganism is healthy for the median of the human population. Those are two very different things. I think veganism can be very healthy for some people. I think it's the only thing that is healthy for others. And I think it can be a really great tool for healing people coming off a standard American diet or just helping bring awareness into how our diets um, impact our planet and the uh, animals we cohabitate with. So he has uh, been through the veganism phase and he has done his own research and done his own experimenting and he also did not fare well on a vegan diet and it's probably one of the things that really got him interested in human physiology and uh, obesity neurobiology. So moving on from that, I want to point this out because he did a series of um, blogs on his, his page called Whole Health Source where he talks about the subject that I'm going to talk about briefly here today and you can go there and, and read a little bit more extensively on his um, distillery of the many papers that I will be referring to today. Okay, let's get into it. Whether it's claims that carbohydrates cause heart disease and diabetes or whether it's claims that saturated fat clogs arteries and will kill you or whether it's the claim that meat causes cancer and heart disease, all of these claims may have some associations, may have even some truth, some anecdotal truths for some people, but they lack conclusive evidence for human diet and nutrition health no matter what any YouTuber claims. And this is, this is the point that I want to make about where we're at with human health and science nutrition. We are in the deep of debate. There is no theory of human heart disease. A theory is when basically science has, and I'm just simplifying this, that science has gone through its research and pretty much the, the median of science agrees that this is what's happening. Like the theory of gravity, for example. Yeah, sure, some people are challenging it in this way and that way as technology becomes newer and more advanced, but we generally understand and agree how gravity works on the planet. We don't have that around nutrition science yet. So... Again, this is me coming back to anybody making absolutist claims has to be challenged. And so with that, I present the curious case of the Kitavas. And uh, this is really awesome research. And before I go any further, I just want to say, like, if I'm presenting some data, it doesn't mean this is the diet that I think everyone should follow. 
I'm just talking about a study, okay? Let's clear, clear the air there now. So the Kitabas, this study was an ongoing study, probably some of the, I think, the most important um, research done in the last 20 years because we're so rapidly losing any data from um, indigenous humans. And the Kitabas live in uh, this small island off of Papua New Guinea. And when these studies were conducted, they had yet to have any Western diet influences. None. So they were uh, still living in a traditional manner. And what I like about this study is that they weren't hunter and gatherers. So a lot of the, the paleo ilk will like use the Maasai tribe. And the Maasai tribe is a really interesting case in human longevity and health. But the, um, the Kitavas were, they grew things. They were agriculturalists, and they hunted, and they gathered. So they had this full spectrum of agriculture foods, fruits, roots, uh, wild um, plants, and uh, wild game, and domestic game. Uh, they had no evidence in their population of heart disease, no evidence of stroke, no evidence of cancer, no evidence of diabetes, total evidence of longevity, low body mass in general. People lived without Western medicine to very old ages and were very active in their old ages. And there was a point, in fact, where one person had left the island to go live uh, on a mainland and live a modern life, and they were, they were the only, they said, the only fat Kitavan. So this guy, this Swedish researcher, wanted to study this population because um, Sweden went through uh, a time where they were really, uh, actually all of Scandinavia went through sort of this period where there was a lot of problems with heart disease there, and they were trying to figure out why. And uh, the Kitavans are really an intrigue. They, they eat plenty of meat. They eat plenty of cholesterol. They eat a lot of, a lot of saturated fat because they have a lot of coconut on the island. So it's saturated, plant-based saturated fat in addition to animal fat. They don't eat a lot of um, game meat or pork, but they do eat some for uh, intermittent special occasions their regular daily diet, and this goes against what a lot of like low-fat, low, you know, ketogenic, um, carb-free gurus say like, oh, carbs make the heart disease. The ketavans actually eat a really high-carb and high-starch diet. They eat um, up to 67% of their diet is carbohydrates. Uh, they eat tons of fruit. They eat tons of tubers like yams and taro and um, um, sweet potato and other tubers for the island. And they eat a lot of uh, fresh and fermented greens, and um, they eat a lot of seafood. So every day, they normally finish the end of their day with some sort of seafood. And, you know, how their diet is set up is actually really intriguing to me and it's and it's how I've sort of filtered down to after all of this experimentation of how I love to eat and what they generally do and and I became really interested in that I've been reading this a lot over the last couple of days but how they eat is they um they normally have a pretty strong breakfast of starches and it may have some some sort of creams or greens or something added along with the starches and when I say creams, I mean more like probably coconut creams, not, not animal creams. They don't do really dairy there. And then throughout the day, they don't really eat another meal, but they kind of graze on fruit and uh, coconut water. And just like, you know, it's tropical there, so they probably just like to eat a little lighter, but having a lot of the tropical fruits. And then in the evening, they switch back to starch, greens, and proteins and fats again. So their diet is, um, this is directly from the research, and he took a sampling at one point, so I don't, I don't know if this uh, reflects their year-round 
diet, but it was um, tons of tropical fruit, guava, banana, pineapple, um, and uh, I think they had some watermelon and, and stuff like that. And then they ate a lot of sweet potato, squash, taro, cassava. That's the other one I was thinking about. And uh, greens. And then a lot of uh, fish and oysters and other types of seafood. So it is entirely fascinating to me that this isolated population with no Western influences, I think they do now, but at the time of the studies, they were still isolated from Western influences. So no sodas, no processed foods, no chemicals in the foods, no refined flours, no refined sugar, no oils. All of these things did not exist in their society. And at the same time, they didn't have chronic disease, they didn't have strokes, they didn't have heart attacks, they didn't have cancer, and they ran the tests, like they ran um, a lot of heart exams and, and brain exams to see if there was any evidence of these types of events happening, and there's ways that they can tell. They didn't find them. They also took blood glucose uh, levels, and they this, this, these people eat way more carbohydrates than a Western diet. And they didn't find high glucose. And that's, you know, they were still eating a lot of saturated fat. So they're eating carbs with fat. And they're eating animal products. And they're still not having problems with glucose levels. Uh, you know, in addition to that, they, they didn't exercise that much. So um, there's some things about talking about the Maasai or whatever. A lot of the um, other populations that were studied were hunter-gatherers. So moving all day long, uh, oftentimes, or working all day long, much more activity. But this population was making that transition from hunter-gatherer to agriculture. They, they had very moderate activity, according to the researcher. They, you know, did some work gardening and went out and did some fishing and probably did some swimming and dancing when they got together for social activities. But they weren't like hardcore active. They weren't doing miles and miles of, you know, walking around looking for food sources. They weren't doing, um, you know, heavy labor that happens in some totally agriculture reliant uh, societies. They were somewhere in between and they just didn't show these problems that we are claiming are related to X, Y, and Z. And, you know, of course, I'm, I'm not from Papua New Guinea. Maybe they have isolated genetics because they're on an island. Who knows? But my point is here is that these absolutist claims that, that humans who eat high saturated fat diets are going to have heart disease, that is not the case. We have some association evidence. And I would even say that there is some sort of like responsibility that's felt by these various organizations in our country to kind of try to help steer lost people who don't know how to eat a whole foods diet towards a more healthful eating. But um, it doesn't mean that, you know, saturated fat's going to kill you. Eating animal products is the cause of cancer. Just look at everything. We don't know that. Nutrition science has not come to those conclusions. And to honestly, to come to those conclusions, you would have to do very unethical research. And uh, so we can say, yeah, there's some associations. Yeah, okay, we know that humans do great on plant-saturated diets. And that's what we see in the Kitabans. They are, their diets loaded with fresh fruits and vegetables and tubers. And they also have animal products. And they have a lot of saturated fat mixed in with the carbohydrates. And they still didn't show signs of elevated glucose in the research. That's another thing that's interesting. They had normal to low glucose levels. Uh, so I think that we need to keep our minds open. We need to keep questioning. We need to keep reading. And if anybody tells you that if you eat some chicken, you're going to have heart disease or cancer. You really need to
consider where you're taking information from. So I have more research I want to talk about and uh, I hope I can kick out some more some more videos soon. I'm almost done with at least the very first supplement video. We'll see you next time.